Hi, welcome to Bernina Community Studio. I'm Bernina educator Haley Grish, and I am so happy to be coming to you guys today again from our home studio um, at the Bernina offices and our new studio. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to share with you guys, you know, more, more of the, these lessons and more content coming from this great new space. So today's sewing class, I'm going to be um, working on the Sandhill Sling bag, and we're not going to construct the whole bag in this lesson. It's just a little bit too long, and um, honestly, it's not my, my pattern to teach. So I'm going to share with you some of my favorite construction tips um, when it comes to working with bags and some heavy-duty projects like this. Bags are some of my favorite projects to make. They're fairly quick to construct. They usually take a day or less. Um, they don't have any fitting requirements, um, but they still have some fun construction challenges. And they, you can always find an excuse to make one because they make great gifts. As soon as the Sandhill Sling pattern launched, uh, I believe last fall, it was immediately on my to-do list. The design is really clean. There are really nice professional finishing details. Um, it's a compact size, but it's still pretty roomy. It can hold plenty of stuff, um, but you won't get lost in there. And anyone could carry this bag. It doesn't necessarily need to feel like a handbag. It's just a compact utility little kind of a backpack. So like I said, we're not going to go through the whole construction today. Um, but I'm going to share my favorite techniques to work through this, um, not just in construction, um, but a little bit of embellishing too and um, personalizing a pattern like this. So let's start the way we always do, talking about supplies. Of course, we have the pattern booklet. Um, their anagram of Noodle Head Patterns, who wrote this pattern, she is such a great pattern writer. Um, she's very thorough, there's great illustrations, and one of my favorite things about this pattern, which, you know, you can, you can tell the person who wrote this is a person who sews. She has, of course, our pattern pieces. There's a couple that you'll want to trace onto some template plastic or pattern tracing paper. But she has these labels that you can cut out and then wonder clip to your pieces as you're cutting them. So you can keep everything really clean and organized. Um, and when you're working on a project like this and you have lots of little pieces, it's really easy to confuse you know, what's what. So I love that she included this. I have my pattern pieces here. Um, a couple things you will also need are uh, fusible interfacing. I love OESD's fusible, fusible Woven. You could also use Pellon Shape Flex. The two products are really similar. Um, they're a woven cotton fabric with fusible glue on one side. The OESD Fusible Woven, I think is just a little bit more body to it. I think the weave of the cotton is just a little bit tighter, um, which makes it my choice for like a bag project like this and something where I'm not really concerned about drape. I want to add bulk and, and uh, sturdiness to my fabric. The OESD Fusible Woven is really great. And both, both products come in either white or black, so you can choose the best one to go with the value of fabric that you have. You will need some zippers for this bag. Everyone's afraid of zippers. I'm going to be using um, just regular zippers. You'll need uh, one you know, standard zipper for the front pocket. There's two views of this bag. The one that I'm doing has the zipper front. Um, and then you'll need a purse zipper. So that's one that has two zipper poles on it that open up and meet, or they kiss a little bit in the middle. Because zippers like this can be a little bit tricky to find exactly the right one, I recommend using zippers by the yard. They're a great um, tool if you've never used them before. I'll talk a little bit more about using these when we get to the zipper portion um, of the project, but um, these are great because they come in so many colors. You can get contrasting zipper pulls. You can get really fun with it, and you'll always have a zipper that's exactly the size that you need and exactly the kind of zipper that you need when you're using them by the yard. And of course, you will need some thread. 
I'm gonna recommend using two different kinds of thread for this project. One polyester, um, anywhere between like a 60 and a 40 weight um, for your general construction and bobbin thread. I love Metrocene, it's like my go-to for a lot of my projects. If I'm working on a garment on my sewing machine, this is the thread that I'm using. Um, it's a, I think it is a 50 weight poly. It's great for everything. You'll also wanna use a top stitching thread. So I'm going to be using uh, Orifil 28 weight. This is a cotton thread. Um, cotton thread is you know, not as strong as poly, uh, but for a top stitching seam, it doesn't need to be. And because it's a little bit heavier weight, it, does, it is you know, fairly robust. I just like the soft look of a cotton thread for top stitching. Um, but your bobbin thread, regardless of the needle, is going to be that poly. And you wanna make sure you're using the right needle, you know, both for these threads and to handle some bulky seams. So I'm gonna recommend a jeans needle and it's either, either a size 90 or 100 if you're using that thicker top stitching thread and um, if you're using a fabric that, has, that already has some bulk to it, like I'm using an Essex linen, um, and then it's also interface, that's, a pretty, that's pretty tough. And then when we get to multiple layers of that fabric, that's a bulky seam to get through. The size 100 is gonna be able to glide through anything you put under it, like butter. Um, but if you're using a little bit lighter weight fabric, um, or if you choose to top stitch with maybe like a triple stitch and like poly sheen, a 90 would probably do you fine as well. Of course, you'll need some cutting tools, your rotary cutter, ruler, a mat. Um, I always have scissors and little thread snips on hand. And for pressing, you're gonna need a good iron. Um, again, these really bulky fabrics are thick, tough, you know, home deck type fabrics. A good iron is really important, like your Laura Star. Um, and I'm also gonna recommend using a clapper. A clapper is a wood block tool like this. Um, this one is specifically like a garment clapper, so it has some different angles that are used for garment sewing, but you can find some that are just kind of this oblong shape. Um, the trick with the clapper is that the wood is going to help absorb moisture in your fabric if you use steam to press, and it's also going to help you know, kind of absorb the heat from the fabric and help your seam cool faster. And because, you know, those two things combined with just a little bit of pressure result in really nice, flat, crisp seams. I use my clapper on like all of my seams now, any kind of pressing, just because the result is always super nice. I also recommend having some marking tools. Everyone's preference here is a little bit different. Um, personally, I categorize my marking tools in two different ways. One are markings that are just for me. So they're gonna be things that fall inside a seam allowance or on the wrong side of my fabric. Anything that I know in the finished project isn't going to be visible. And for those, I will use friction pens. I know friction pens are a little bit controversial. Um, there are issues with uh, some, some colors on some colors of fabric will leave like a ghost marking. If the fabric gets too cold, um, the, your friction pen markings will reappear. So they disappear when you put heat on them, but if it gets super cold, sometimes they come back to life. So that's why I keep this ink inside my project, but they come in so many different colors. I really like the little felt tip markers um, they are a really great tool, but you need to use them in the right context. For anything that's going to be visible in the finished project, chalk is always my favorite. It's really easy to just brush away when you're done, um, or if it's being a little bit stubborn, sometimes with these colors they can be, just a damp cloth will do ya. So finally, let's talk about our presser feet. The champion here in this project is gonna be dual feed. Dual feed is such a great tool because it allows us to use um, the best presser feet for the techniques like a zipper foot or an edge stitch foot, but it's also gonna give you the strength to power through some of those tough layers without any struggle. 
So in this project, I'm gonna be using my reverse pattern foot number 1D, great general foot. I'm gonna be using the zipper foot 4D. I'll use that edge, edge stitch foot number 10D. And I'm gonna use the open toe foot um, number 20D. And then I am going to use my walking foot number 50. Dual feed will be able to handle pretty much any challenge we throw at it, but there will always be instances where the walking foot is the better choice. I'll get into this a little bit more later when we focus on those bulky seams, but um, just know you want your dual feed, but you're still gonna want your walking foot. I'm also going to be using not just the regular black bobbin case, but I'm gonna bring in the yellow bobbin case. This is our high thread tension bobbin case. But a lot of the time we talk about this with embroidery, um, but I'm gonna be using it today with a little bit of decorative stitching, which is the first thing that we're gonna get into here. So I'm gonna set my other presser feet aside. Let's just get some stuff out of the way. And I'll be using the 20D foot and again, that yellow bobbin case. So for the decorative stitching that I wanna do, I wanted to add just a little bit of a stitch to this lapped zipper. Um, it's just a really cute little area and I thought it could use you know, some jazzing up. Um, it finishes at about 5 eighths of an inch tall. So it's like the perfect size to throw in a nice nine millimeter decorative stitch. So my pieces for this, again, here's those, my little labels, those are so great. I have my zipper cover piece already cut. It has the fusible interfacing on the back side. And I'm going to first, before we put it on some stabilizer, I'm gonna mark out my stitching area. So I wanna identify exactly where this decorative stitch is going to live because this piece is gonna get folded. There's some seam allowances to think about. So first I'm going to mark the seam allowance that's going to be along the top once this is stitched in. And this is being attached to the zipper. Um, so that seam is gonna be a little bit different size than most of the construction seams. It'll be about 3 8 of an inch. So I'll use my ruler and because this part might be visible in the finished product, I would normally use chalk here, but for visibility's sake, I want to make sure you guys can see what I'm doing. I'm gonna use the friction pen and a nice high contrast color. So I'm gonna measure about 3 8 and mark that out. And I'm then going to mark one inch in because this will be the point where this piece is folded. So this is gonna be my, you know, top to bottom, my visible area. And then on the left and right side, I'm going to mark out the uh, seam allowance for the ultimate like construction of this front panel. And that's gonna be about half an inch. And I'm not gonna go all the way down here, just a little notch. Okay, so I'm going to make just a couple more markings along here before we start stitching. So here is my you know, visible area for that decorative stitch. And I'm gonna have my stitch follow the seam allowance along the top here. I'm gonna make some markings inside the seam allowances on the left and right as a guide for myself. So I'm gonna make a little mark every inch or so. Again, nothing, nothing big, just enough for me to be able to see it. 
Okay, so I have marked these out because um, when I'm placing my decorative stitch, I'm gonna be using the tool pattern elongation to make sure that my stitch pattern lines up exactly right in that visible area. I don't want any of this either of, on either end of the stitch um, to be like cut off in the seam allowance. I'm gonna use pattern elongation to make that stitch pattern exactly the size that I want so that an even number of stitches will fit in my visible area. And so by marking out those seam allowances and putting a little notch every inch, I will be able to see as I'm sewing out, you know, am I, is, is everything measuring the way that I want it to as it works down the seam line? And I can make some adjustments if I notice that it's not. So I'm going to add some uh, stabilizer to this. This fabric with the fusible woven is pretty stable on its own, um, but with decorative stitching, I just always like to add stabilizer. It never hurts to add a little bit more. This is just ultra clean and tear from OESD. I have two layers here, um, and I'm just gonna place it on there. So now at the machine, I'm going to attach my 20D foot. This foot has that nice big open toe, so I'll be able to see really well where my uh, decorative stitch is falling. And I'm gonna put in my yellow bobbin case with um, that poly thread in there. And rather than cutting the thread tail, I'm gonna bring it up right now. I need to pull that out of the way. Okay, so let's check out some decorative stitches. Um, on my sample, I used this little like kind of scallopy wave stitch that's on my 790. But looking through the 590, there are some really fun ones in here. So I'm gonna go to the decorative stitch menu. Uh, I'm gonna look at satin stitches because I want something that's, you know, gonna stand out. And you could pull really any of these, but I'm really liking this 406, this little uh, triangle. And I can see that this stitch at its default is measuring 13.3 millimeters in length. So to do so, a little bit of math to get this to line up exactly right, for your reference, one inch converted into millimeters is about 25.5 millimeters, and half an inch is 12.7. So with this being 13.3, rather than scaling it up to an inch, I'm gonna bring it down just a little bit um, to get it to fit at my about half inch mark. And then because this is an even uh, measurement of space that I'm filling, it's seven inches wide. I know that 14 repeats of that half inch stitch is gonna fill that space perfectly. I know you didn't come in here for a math class, but sometimes you have to with sewing. Um, so in the information menu, you will find this little icon here, this triangle um, with the two little arrows up and down. That's our pattern elongation. Pattern elongation is gonna let you adjust a stitch pattern. This is particularly helpful with decorative stitches, satin stitches in particular. You'll be able to adjust a stitch pattern by individual percentages so you can really fine tune the stitch because if you adjust the stitch length like you would want to you know, intuitively, it's gonna change things really drastically and it also is just making these stitches kind of pile on top of each other. It's not accommodating any uh, stitch density changes. Pattern elongation will. So let me put this back at the default. So with my percentages here, I can bring this down, you know, in a single percent, and you can see this is reducing the stitch length by like, you know, fractions of a millimeter. You can get super precise with it. But as it's doing this, it's also recalculating the density for this satin stitch. So you're not gonna end up with something like super chunky just because you wanted to shrink it down a little bit. You can also just adjust the uh, 
stitch density. So if you're using a thicker thread, like my 28 weight top stitching thread, and you're sewing it out and see that it just looks a little bit too thick, um, or by the same note, you know, if you're using a finer thread and you see too much space um, between the stitches, you can adjust the density of that stitching to fit your thread, you know, appropriately. So I'm not gonna mess with the density here. I've, I've tested my stitch and I like how it looks with the 28 weight at, you know, the default for the, that the machine, you know, programs for it. But I am going to adjust this uh, length. So again, 13.3, I wanna bring this down to at least 12.7. Um, and I think to do that, we're looking at, you know, five, six percent. I can bring it a little bit under that 12.7 in practice. I've noticed that I need to scale it down just a little bit more than that math works out to. Um, so I'm going to bring it, I'm actually going to bring mine to 93 percent. It's telling me 12.3 is my stitch pattern length. And of course, you'll want to test any of this uh, stitching. I already have, so we're just going to run with it. <laughs> um, and before I actually start sewing, I'm going to go back into my practical stitches, select a straight stitch, and move that all the way to the left. So that needle position, negative five, falls in line perfectly with the first stitch of my decorative stitch. Starting with a couple of straight stitches is how I'm going to secure my seam rather than trying to backstitch in pattern in a decorative stitch. This is a much cleaner way to get things started. So I'm gonna put this under the presser foot. This marked line here is falling just inside the left toe and I'm about a quarter inch behind my, um, my marking indicating this side's seam allowance. So I'm gonna take a couple of stitches, three stitches, I'll do a back stitch. And when I hit that marking for my seam allowance, I'm gonna jump back to my uh, decorative stitch. I can go through the menus or I can just type it in. I know it's four of six. And those adjustments that I made with pattern elongation are intact. Thank you, temporary altered stitch memory. And again, because I've done the math of how many repeats should fit in here, it's 14, I'm going to use pattern repeat and say, I want this to stitch out 14 times. Now, when I press my start stop button, the machine will just stitch the 14 and it will stop when it's done. So I'm gonna use the start stop so that I can keep my hands on the fabric, keep my attention here to make sure that this is sewing out exactly where I want it. And if I need to nudge this a little bit just to make sure that line is falling where I want it to, I can do that. All right, we don't need to show you guys stitching out the whole thing. I'm gonna bring this up and show you what the stitch looks like. And in the process, tell you why I'm using that yellow bobbin case. So with a decorative stitch like this, a satin stitch, it's really important that that needle thread is meeting, you know, the, meeting the fabric and even being pulled to the wrong side just a little bit for the best you know, looking stitch. Because I tested this, I'd realized that the high thread tension bobbin case is gonna give me the best result. Um, again, always test your stitching. There's a reason that you have all of these tools at your disposal. Um, so you can have anything stitch out exactly the way you want it to. You can always get the perfect looking stitch. So I have already sewn one of these out. Let me slide this over here. So here is my finished uh, little zipper cover panel. I'm just gonna tear out my stabilizer. 
it's gonna leave some behind the stitch itself, but that's all right. It's gonna keep things looking nice as my bag wears. And I'm gonna give this a quick press because we will use it in our next step to, con to construct uh, the lapped zipper. So working through the pattern for this bag, the first thing that I wanna talk about um, when it comes to construction is the little lapped zipper pocket on the front of the bag. There is a version of this bag that you can make with a snap pocket, but personally, just setting that hardware is kind of a pain. Um, just setting in a zipper is pretty foolproof for me. I always have consistent results, so that's the route that I usually go. And before we get started, I wanted to talk a little bit more about zippers by the yard in case you've never used them before. So you get a big continuous coil of zipper tape. It's usually like three or four yards and you get a little bag full of all of the zipper poles. Um, and like I said, you can also get contrasting ones. Um, I know there's a little mixed bag from Biannis that has just you know a random assortment of colors. Um, so that can be really fun, but when you use these, what you'll want to do is continuously cut off from just one end of the zipper tape. And so that your starting end, you know, the last bit that you'll get to has the finished edge on it um, all the time. And so for this bag, I have one just little regular zipper here and I have one purse zipper. I want to talk to you about how we make a purse zipper like this from our zipper by the yard tape. So because I'm making two here, I'm just gonna load all three zipper poles on at the same time. I'm gonna put one on first and you can see, you know, the little coils um, on the edge of the tape before you actually hit the, the nylon teeth of the zipper. You want to feed those into this zipper pole and I'm gonna actually open, I'm gonna open this before I put that on. You'll feed the coil in on either side, which can, I'm sure, be a little bit tricky to see, but you'll see in practice. And pull this so the teeth should be just right about lined up. And there you go. So you have a tat one pole on your zipper here and you'll pull that all the way to the other end because like I said, this is the end that you're gonna wanna cut from. So you'll make this, put this at about the point that you need it to be, but I'm just gonna leave it on there. And then to make the purse zipper, you'll do the same thing feeding the poles on but you'll just put them on in alternating directions. So you'll have one go on, you know, what feels like normally, and then you'll have one go on um, head to head with that one. And again, you'll just slide the poles all the way to the other end and you'll cut when you actually need to and when you're actually sewing these in. Because I have ready-made zippers um, on hand today, that's what I'm gonna be using, but I just thought those are super cool and I wanted to show you guys how we do that. Okay, so setting my purse zipper aside, we're gonna construct this um, little front pocket or front panel of the bag. And to do that, I have my pieces ready here. Here's our little decorative stitched um, zipper cover piece. I have the zipper pocket top which has my fusible woven on the back. And then I have the zipper pocket bottom, which has my lining fabric and the exterior fabric also um, with the fusible interfacing. So the first part we wanna do is to put the pocket bottom on the bottom edge of the zipper. So I'm gonna lay my exterior fabric right side up Actually, I'm gonna jump over here to our super close-up camera so you guys can really see what I'm doing. So this is um, the exterior right side up. I'm gonna take my zipper and I'm gonna put it right side down, aligning the edge of the zipper tape with the edge of the fabric. 
The zipper is long enough that I can leave my hardware you know, off to the side. I don't need to worry too much about moving it when I'm in the process of sewing. It's gonna stay out of the way. So I have this right sides together zipper with the exterior fabric. And then I'm gonna take my lining and I'm gonna put this right side down on top of the zipper, aligning all of those edges you know, both at the raw edge here and at the left and right. And then I'm gonna take some wonder clips and just hold those together. Maybe one towards the beginning and one towards the end. All right, now let's jump over to the machine and get that set up for stitching in our zipper. So I still have my decorative stitch set up here. I'm gonna go back to my practical stitches and go back to my straight stitch. I'm gonna swap out the 20D with my 4D, which is our dual feed zipper foot. Make sure you engage the dual feed there. I'm going to replace the yellow bobbin case with the black one, our regular one. Same bobbin, just a different case. Trim that thread. And I'm also going to re-thread. I'm gonna take off that top stitching thread. And always cut your thread at the top and pull it through the needle Thread with my metrocene. My needle right now um, is where I left it for a straight stitch all the way over to the, up to the left. I'm gonna clear that out because I wanna use my needle threader. And pull that through, and cut the excess thread. I'm gonna set my presser foot recognition for the 4D because you know we have this guide right in the center of the foot. You can't stitch in the center needle position. I wanna make sure that my machine's looking out for me and tell it that I am gonna use that foot um, and it will prevent us from doing any damage to the machine, the needle, um, or you know potentially ourselves. When you break a needle, that can be a little bit dangerous. So I'm gonna move my needle position back all the way over to negative five. And I'm gonna place this under the presser foot so that this raw edge on the right lines up perfectly with the edge of my foot. And I'm gonna start um, just in to the actual fabric um, in front of you know, this raw edge at the top here. And I'm gonna start by doing a couple of back stitches. And that's gonna make sure that my seam is secured at the beginning there. And we'll just stitch down this side. This 4D in the, and in combination with the needle position, negative five is gonna give me the perfect seam allowance um, for setting this zipper in. And when I get to the end, again, I'm just gonna take a couple back stitches and cut my threads. Now I'm gonna bring this over to my iron. I'm gonna open this up and right now I'm gonna open this, leaving my zipper right side down with the exterior fabric and just pulling the lining away. I'm gonna give the lining a nice crisp press. 
being careful not to get too close to our zipper teeth. We don't want to melt them. But I'm gonna glide this across. And as I pull the iron away, I'm gonna set my clapper right on top of that seam. And I'm gonna leave it there for a minute and just press down on it, give it a little pressure. And when I lift it away, this is totally cool now. It's not hot at all. And it's really nice and flat. So now I'm gonna fold the lining to the back and press this front side with the exterior fabric. Again, watching those, those little zipper teeth. and bringing in my clapper. Okay, so you could top stitch this at this point. Um, I have a few pieces that I'm going to top stitch in this process, so I'm gonna save all of those um, for later on. Now, the next thing we wanna do is attach the zipper cover. And to do that, again, let's jump over to our little close-up camera. I need to make sure that this is lined up just right um, because, you know, it can't fall, you know, too far to either direction because then it won't get caught in the finished seam allowance. So again, I'm aligning the raw edge to the zipper tape at the top here. And I'm also making sure that the raw edges on the left and right are perfectly aligned. And again, a couple of wonder clips just to hold this in place. Now, before we actually, you know, securely stitch this in, I'm going to baste it. And to do that, I'm gonna keep my zipper foot on. I'm gonna move my needle position over to the right to, let's say position three. I wanna make sure that this stitching line stays within the seam allowance, which um, again, along the zipper is about three eighths of an inch. And so um, moving my needle over, you know, three, even four, will just barely catch that raw edge and be really, really close to the raw edge, but still sew through everything. And I know for sure it's not gonna be visible in the finished project. I don't need to worry about back stitching or anything because this is just a basting. It's just to kind of hold things together as, we're, as we work through this. So this is basted in. And the last thing we want to do is add the zipper top. So again, nice and close up. You can see I have just barely catching the edge here. I'm now going to take the top piece and align it uh, with those raw edges right side down. This is where having dual feed on a zipper foot is really gonna help you out because this is pretty bulky actually, this seam, especially for being along the zipper because we have one layer with interfacing here for the pocket top. We have two layers here for the zipper cover and then the zipper tape itself. So this is, this is a substantial seam. Um, and by using the dual feed zipper foot, everything is gonna move together evenly. You don't have to worry about any of your pieces shifting when you get to those edges, which like I said, you wanna make sure those are really neatly lined up because they may or may not catch in the final construction if they move too far. So. Let's go over to the machine and sew this seam in. I'm gonna bring my needle position back 
all the way to negative 5. And again, I want to start a little bit into the fabric and start with a back stitch. And then sew down with the edge of my fabric aligned with my zipper foot. And at the end, couple back stitches and cut. Now I'm going to press this away from that zipper cover. And again, you know, this is, we got some bulk here. Um, pressing this exterior fabric that's interfaced um, is pretty thick. And so really the clapper helps a lot to make sure that that's gonna stay nice and flat. So looking up close here, you can see my decorative stitch because I marked out um, my stitching area lines up really nicely with the seam um, for the pocket top. And at this point, I would go in and top stitch along this seam and also on the bottom of the zipper. Um, you can you know, just pin this out of the way or use a little bit of the OESD tear away tape. That's really nice too. I'm gonna use the 10D to do that. When you do that, you guys know, you line that guide up with your seam and your top stitching is gonna stay you know, perfectly parallel to that seam allowance because it's always gonna be riding neatly against it. So that is our little zipper pocket. So the last thing that I wanna work through today is how to tackle some really bulky seams. You'll come across points in really any bag pattern um, where you need to stitch up and across some really thick spots in seam, allowance, uh, seam allowances. And sometimes there's like six or eight layers of canvas that you're working through. Sewing through these seams themselves is no challenge for your Bernina, you guys know that. But getting up from sewing through maybe two layers to suddenly like eight or nine layers, knowing how to handle that jump um, is what I want to talk about today without sacrificing, you know, your stitch quality and the strength of your seam. So on our Sandhill Sling bag, there is a spot on the back side of the bag where we have this little piece, um, the strap holder. It's got a little D-ring stitched into it. And we're going to sew this um, to the bottom left-hand corner of the bag. She gives you a measurement of where this needs to go. It is one and a quarter inches in from the left side. So I'm gonna measure and mark that. And so this little tab is gonna line up right there. And I'm gonna hold that with a wonder clip because this is pretty thick. I'm not gonna take pins to this. So now we'll take this over to the machine to stitch it in. And here is where I'm gonna be using my walking foot. The walking foot is always your best bet when handling bulk. If you look at the difference between a walking foot and a foot with dual feed, your walking foot is making contact with the fabric to grab it with the feed dog and pull all of it through at the same time versus dual feed, which is just one arm pulling from the back of the fabric to pull it through. So when you have all of these different layers shifting or having the potential to shift, having a walking foot to grab it and pull it through all together, you're gonna have a better um, stitch, a better seam. So the final seam allowance here is going to be a half an inch, just like the rest of the bag, but I'm just going to baste this in. And because of that, I wanna make sure that this basting line again is falling within that seam allowance but I still wanna make sure I have the best traction with my walking foot. So when I'm sewing, 
I want to make sure that my fabric is coming at least to the edge of this presser foot. Um, but at that size, if I leave my needle in the center position, that's going to give me about a half inch seam allowance. And that's a little bit bigger than I want it to be. So just to nudge it within that, um, within the seam allowance, I'm just going to move my needle position over to the right. I'm going to move it to three. We'll put it at four just to be safe. So now I know that I'm getting uh, a seam that's falling within that half inch, but I'm still getting the best contact with the fabric for the presser foot. I'm going to start stitching this. And even though it's a basting stitch, I'm leaving my stitch length at 2.5. Again, because this is really bulky, um, having it a little bit shorter seam allowance or a uh, stitch length, sorry, is going to give my stitch more strength um, and make sure that this tab holds up really well as the bag wears. So as I approach the strap holder, my presser foot is running into the fabric itself. It's going to be really tricky for me to suddenly have the presser foot jump up onto um, this really thick layer. And we have a tool to help with that, and that is the height compensation tool. It's this little plastic tool. It comes with any Bernina. And I think it's really overlooked. It's a great tool, um, especially for projects like this. So it's three pieces on a little hinge here. And you want to make this tool the same height as the thickness of the seam that you're coming up to. So all three layers is a little bit higher than what my fabric is here. Two is pretty much exactly the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise my presser foot. I have my needle left down in the fabric. And I'm going to slide the height compensation tool underneath this side of the presser foot. So now we have a flat surface, at least on one side, um, leading straight up to this fabric. So I'll lower my presser foot down. And I have this running parallel to my stitching line. <clears throat> and I want to make sure that this doesn't come anywhere near my needle, but is, is staying under the presser foot. So I'm going to keep stitching here. I get my wonder clip out of the way. And it's going to bring me right up onto this thick fabric. Now my needle is in that fabric, and I can pull this tool out of the way. To make this extra secure, I'm actually going to back stitch one. And on that stitch that's bridging the gap between the single layer and the really thick layers. So now I'm going to keep going across this. And as I reach the other end, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to put my tool in front of the presser foot. And give myself that nice uh, even surface. And I'll take a stitch. That one is the one that dropped just into the single layer. So I'm going to back stitch one. That just gives a little extra security on that edge where things tend to wear a little bit more. And I'll just keep stitching. And because this is you know, basting, I'm not going to back stitch here. I'm just going to cut my threads. So now you can see. We have our seam here. Our uh, strap holder is set in securely. We made that nice big jump from a single layer here to, this is, I believe, five layers. We have four with the strap holder plus one of the main fabric that we stitched it down onto. And everything is really nice and secure. Our stitches are even. And you know this is going to hold up well as you wear the bag and use it, throw it around, and even throw it in the wash. So thank you for joining me today for Bernina Community Studio. I hope these tips uh, help you in the bag making process, give you some ideas how to add some fun extra details, um, and personalize your projects. So until next time, happy sewing. <laughs>